The UK will receive the first batch, of course, of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine within hours after regulators became the first in the world to approve the jab yesterday. Um, Amid concerns that people won't take the vaccine, government ministers are reportedly pressuring social media sites to prevent lies and conspiracy theories being posted on their pages. But... Research out today suggests uh, that the percentage of people who say they won't take the vaccine has increased by 9% since July, with 31% of people surveyed by my GP saying they will swerve the jab. Uh, the main five objections are the speed that this came to market, possible side effects, hearing that pregnant women and under-18s aren't eligible, uh, trust not knowing enough, including ingredients, and also not necessary, uh, with a survival rate of COVID being 99%. Let's speak with Dr. William Budd, clinical research physician at Imperial College. They played an instrumental role in vaccine clinical trials, of course. Uh, Dr. Budd, afternoon to you. Nice to have you with us. Um, and I think some people from the WHO were, were just saying, in reference to similar questions, um, it's perfectly natural, right, to be a little reserved about something new? Yes, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um Many people, as you just mentioned yourself, may not have had a vaccine before anyway, so it's a completely new concept to them. Uh, and as you just listed those five reasons, people are nervous. It's completely understandable that a drug that's been produced um, for a pandemic, when we're nervous anyway about that, can mm. have some questions raised about it. Yeah. So so the idea that 31% of people say they won't take the vaccine, did that surprise you? Uh, that did surprise me. That that my GP surgery, uh, sorry, my GP um, survey um was quite interesting actually how it's increased from 22 percent before yeah. so now that things have been legislated and have been approved for use you think it might have gone down but the fact that it's gone up shows that there needs to be some education and that's you know one in three people is quite a lot of people yeah i mean what what do you think is that this is down to i mean you know we, we can talk about conspiracy theories and we know that so social media i mean it would be hilarious if it wasn't so serious i suppose because that's partly where or almost mainly where many of these theories begin their life Yes, absolutely. You're completely right. Some of the theories that I see or are presented to me when people ask questions, I think they're absolutely balmy. Mm. Um, but then also quite worrying that it's about such a serious topic. Um, I don't know where they start um, and I don't know how they gain such traction. I think social media is quite easy to make things viral, but I think it's important for us to address these issues uh, yeah. and, and have a two-way conversation with the people who are who have concerns so we can answer concerns and give them more confidence yeah I, I mean, it's kind of the new flat earthers i suppose it's it, it's just the contemporary version of that and, and there's never been a time when people didn't think there were all sorts of strange goings on in the highest echelons that control the world and um i, I guess there was a physician um William, you, you, you probably look at these with, with a mixture of, you know, a, 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 a smile, but also, you know, disappointment because this is your world. You understand what vaccines are, what they do, the work behind them, the, uh, the, the life saving properties. So, I mean, when you cut away all the nonsense and the conspiracy, uh, it, it must be deeply disappointing to see that people have those kind of reservations. Uh, so I suppose, you know, when you work so hard on a vaccine to try and help people, it can be disappointing. But I think it's also important for us as scientists and as doctors to understand that our level of knowledge about such subjects is far higher than the general population. So obviously we go to university and study it and we work on it for years. So there has to be some understanding from us that mm. there will be concerns, which is understandable. And if, if you don't understand something, you may fear it. And we need to help address those concerns so people can be confident. Yeah, well, let's give that a little go just in the short time we have. Um, let's talk through some of these if we can, William. Um, these are the main objections I mentioned at the beginning there. The speed that this came to market, what's the clinical response to that? Yeah, so uh, the speed, I can understand why people were nervous about that, but never before has so many people across the entire world worked on the same project. So, you know, the data sharing that we have now and the ability to share data so quickly, that's one of the reasons. Uh, another thing that can limit trials is a number of volunteers. So you have to vaccinate or give drugs to a certain number of people before you get approved. But with so many people volunteering to be part of a vaccine trial, that's helped speed it up. And work has been done before on vaccines similar to this nature, especially because we've had SARS and MERS before, which are related mm. diseases. So um, it's not like it's actually just been since we've had COVID. Work has been done before for yeah. years. So uh, there was a kind of a, there was a sort right of a now. template waiting to be pulled out of the, yes. the Petri dish, as it were. 
Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, in terms of side effects, now, I, I did mention this at the beginning. I mean, this could be applicable to any kind of medicine or, or jab, I guess. But um, completely understandable, you know, over the years. I mean, thankfully, few and far between. But when they happen, they are devastating. Thalidomide, of course, is the one that springs to mind. What, what is your response when people ask you about side effects? Yeah, so I think it's good for people to ask about side effects because, you know, if they're going to take the drug or the vaccine, they want to know what's going to happen to them after, um, which is good to ask. So side effects, especially in vaccines, are quite important because so what we're trying to do when we give you a vaccine is get an immune response from your body. Uh, and that immune response is very similar to what happens if you were to actually get the illness. So that's why some of the side effects seem to mimic that. Um, so it's good. It shows that it's working. Your immune system is responding to it and you can get very, very minor side effects that only last a day or two. But it's actually almost a good sign because it means that you're actually working against a, against a vaccine. We're tricking your body into thinking it's got a virus, yeah. and that's why you're responding the way you do. So that that might mean that there are similar with the flu vaccine, of course. That there, that there are moments when you think, "Wow, I feel I feel horrendous," but actually, that that's your body doing what it's meant to do. Yes, exactly. Um, trust, uh, not knowing what's in it. I mean, you know, when I go to the, the the supermarket, like yourself, I'm sure, you know, I do try to look at those ingredients on the back, but I've never uh, tried it. With, in fact, one of my pet annoyances is opening up in a packet of paracetamol and finding something equivalent to a roadmap in every small, tiny yes. packet. <laughs> it's, it's like, do they still have to put this in here? I know legally they do, of course, um, but we very rarely read them. And even if we did read them, it wouldn't mean too much to us, I'd imagine. What... People want to know what's in it. Yes, I think that's understandable as well. I think that's where education really needs to play a huge part because some of the names of things may be completely confusing to the general public. Uh, you know, they may very long words often is used in medicine, which was the bane of my medical degree. I never understand <laughs> half of them. Yeah, you got through but, um, it. I think it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. I did get through it. So I think it's important that we um, address those concerns and explain each one of the ingredients if someone has concern what it actually is and what it means and you know often it's other things that are naturally occurring and many other things such as foods and it's important to you know get those similarities and point out someone that you know say eating an apple half of the stuff in that is also in the vaccine so it's not too different yeah uh, so we had a, a, a question from Teresa in seven actually said uh Teresa says she's a christian she's concerned that she'd heard there was fetal tissue in a vaccine do you know if that is true yeah, so that's that's not true. That is something that is a conspiracy theory that's um, been circulating recently. So, so what that is from is that we use different cell lines, and that's just cells that live um, forever, or, or we can replicate in labs very easy. And that's where we test vaccines on. So, an example of a famous cell line is HeLa, so the Henrietta Lack cells, uh, and this is what where this has come from. So, when we test drugs, we want to make sure we're testing on the same cells each time, so they uh, work as a control. Uh, and one of the cell types is something similar to that. So there's no yeah. human tissue or anything like that in the vaccine. Okay. And one of the big ones, I suppose, uh, lots of people have got in touch with us about this. Um, main objection, uh, it's not necessary because the survival rate, if you get COVID, is about 99%. Why do we need a vaccine? Yep. So um, obviously, it's quite hard, that argument, to say that to someone who's lost a loved one in COVID. That's one of the reasons I would say. like You couldn't really use that argument to the 50,000 families odd that you know have lost someone. Um, another thing is it's not just all about survival or death, as we've seen with this long COVID, which is a new phenomenon we've not seen before in, a, in many other diseases. Uh, even people survive, they can have lasting effects at the moment still for months, maybe even years, and we don't fully understand how long that can go on for. So it's important to get vaccinated because it protects yourself, but it protects others as well. So as you were saying earlier, that pregnant women can't get the vaccine. Uh, and, you know, some people may not get a vaccine for a while, but if you get vaccinated and that helps to lower the transmission rate, and it protects yourself and protects mm -hmm. others, that's important. And, and the WHO may have mentioned now that 60 to 70 percent of people need to be vaccinated mostly to get um, vaccinations working yeah. as much as we want them to. So that's another reason to get vaccinated. Yeah. And what about that other issue? Just a final point here. Um, once you've had the vaccine, can you still spread the virus, though? So that's something I couldn't really answer. That's not, the um, research into that is still ongoing because obviously you need to vaccinate a large number of people to actually work out if that's something that, that has happened. So it's likely to decrease the risk of passing it on. 
it may stop you passing it on, but I, I just couldn't comment at the moment until we've done more research on yeah. that. So if you if you have the vaccine, does that mean you can't get, sort of in layman's terms, you can't get COVID or you can get it, but your body will internally battle with it and you'll, there'll be no manifestation of it? Yes. Yeah. So, so the, way, the way it works at the moment is that it reduces the chance of getting COVID badly or, or even symptomatically. So those who would have had minor symptoms, though they may not get symptoms at all now, and those that would have had very bad COVID or COVID that would have damaged them and particularly badly, that has reduced their effect on them. They're more likely to fight off earlier on than it's less likely to affect them in the long term. Good work. William, um, let's speak again. This is fascinating. Thank you uh, for clearing up some of that as well and just addressing some of those points. Dr. William Budd, clinical research physician at Imperial College. They played an instrumental role in vaccine clinical trials. You heard what he said. Over to you. What are your reasons for saying, I'm not going to have this virus? We're putting the tinfoil hat fraternity to one side. Genuine reasons why you're thinking, no, I'm not going there.